So I, I'm going to share today um, uh, some perils in the management of uh, complex cataract surgery, mostly in the setting of inflammation. So I'm going to start with the concepts of how to manage a uveitic cataract, because I think you can extrapolate that to patients with ocular surface disease, and um, then uh, uh, share some specific um, perils on how to manage uh, or how to accomplish a uh, successful surgery in these challenging uh, cases. I have no conflict of interest with any of the topics that I'm going to be sharing today. Some historical perspective. This is an old paper from the 1970s, and it mentioned that cataract surgery or doing a lensectomy, vitrectomy was known to be hard. And so it was uh, 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 people uh, uh, were not inclined to proceed with these surgeries due to the high number of complications. Uh, we can see here that in the 60s, uh, it, it, because of the difficulty in controlling the inflammation, these were surgeries that people were not doing, uh, and if they were doing, the, the results were not great. But important advances in the field, such as uh, availability of corticosteroids and understanding the control of the inflammation before the surgery, are things that have changed the prognosis of these patients for good. Also, better microscope, better surgical tools, smaller incisions, etc. So. This past 50 years, 60 years, uh, it's, the, the results are getting a lot better. Um, we look back in the early 1990s, um, and the, the placement of an intraocular lens in these patients with uveitis or in inflammatory eye conditions was starting to be accepted. Uh, it was initially criticized, like many things in medicine when they start, but then it was proven to be um, safe and effective. And I'm specifically talking on the topic of adult uh, uveitis uh, patients, pediatric we're not going to touch today because it's a completely different animal. But even in even some authors uh, have uh, mentioned that uh, it is possible to implant a, a lens, uh, though I, I challenge this proposal. This is a very good meta-analysis from the group of Dr. John Kempen. He is an authority in the field of uveitis. And he, he showed in this meta-analysis in his conclusion that cataract surgery in the setting of uveitis can result in normal or near normal visual acuity in the majority of the cases when they have a healthy macula and a healthy optic nerve, of course. And he looked at the data more carefully and showed that just with two months of completely free inflammation, the results can be quite good. Normally, historically, we are taught in the books that it's three months, but we also know that it will depend on the patient and in the diagnosis. There are some pathologies that are uh, more difficult to control than others. Um, and this this number of two to three months of quiescence is is a recommendation, but one has to make the decisions when to proceed. So for UBE cataracts, as a medical uh, surgical recommendation, to do routine cataract surgery in a patient with active or uncontrolled uveitis is irresponsible. It's irresponsible medically and it's irresponsible legally because we can get into trouble, we can get the patient in trouble and, and uh, that's something that we should avoid. So I think the one thing I want to share for those of you that don't see many patients with uveitis is that if you're going to do this surgery, you want to control the inflammation. There's certain, um, there's certain times that you can actually proceed with surgery for example, in fake antigenic uveitis, that surgery is what's going to treat the inflammation, of course. And when the visualization of the fundus is mandatory, for example, in a patient with an oncological problem that's causing inflammation, or when the, the view of the posterior segment is important in order to get to the diagnosis. And um, those are situations that it is acceptable to proceed with surgery. Now we're going to do a journey on the evaluation, uh, the intra the intraoperative approach and the postoperative approach. So more, more important is that we need to have a protocol. We need to have a system on how to approach these patients with inflammation, either ocular surface inflammation or intraocular inflammation. And I think something that's very important is to uh, sit down and look at the diagnosis and establish what's the diagnosis because it's going to be very difficult, very different if you have a patient with unilateral inflammation from, from Fuchs heterochromic erythrocyclitis, for example, where you don't need to be very aggressive in the control of the inflammation compared to a pediatric patient with JRA, with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Those patients, uh, you need to have quiescence for, I would say, for more than six months uh, and really plan your surgery. And most of these patients, and I'm not going to touch much on pediatric surgery, but those patients most of the time will need a lensectomy and maybe leaving the patient a fake. So you can compare all the uveitis, uh, the uveitis that they behave different than others. So you need to have a diagnosis and you also 
need to have in your mind what's going to be the visual outcome because these patients think that by removing the cataract, everything is going to go back to normal. And most of these patients probably already have some chronic macular edema and they may already have glaucoma. So it is good to have a conversation with the patient and if possible, to sit down with the family and all together um, go over the prognosis of the case that we're going to be doing. So always do a review of systems. Um, make sure that you have a defined syndrome. It's very different to have, like I, I was saying, a few heterochromic arthritis versus a herpetic uh, um, trabeculitis, iritis, etc. So uh, we need to order the right labs and have the right uh, diagnosis. And controlling the inflammation, uh, again, is very, very important. Uh, the most important uh, sign uh, to know if it's inflamed, of course, is going to be a clinical examination by the presence or absence of inflammatory cells in the anterior chamber or the vitreous. We can have patients with flare because patients with chronic uveitis can have damage to the aqueous, aqueous blood barrier and uh, they're going to have some chronic flare and the presence of flare is not a contraindication for cataract surgery. It's the presence of active cells that's going to tell us that we should not proceed. Um, there are some tools that are available. Uh, our uveitis service has something called a flare meter, which is a machine that measures more objectively the flare. But so far, uh, we uh, can move on with just a clinical diagnosis on a slit lamp examination. So the control of the inflammation is going to be a step ladder approach. Um, corticosteroids are going to be our best friends and they can become our best enemy if we don't use them responsible. Uh, if we have to control the inflammation uh, with just steroids and we only depend on steroids, we can get into trouble. So we need to know what immunosuppressives are available and what are the new biologic agents. For corticosteroids, I think uh, they, we have to use enough, as many as we need on the, on the routes that we feel comfortable in order to suppress the, inf suppress the inflammation. And there are some patients that are gonna benefit from periocular steroids because Systemic steroids have contraindications due to diabetes, etc. So um, we need to make sure that we control the inflammation. And these are some general recommendations of what we do in you know, those these patients. If these are if these are patients that are uh, very well controlled with the inflammation, this is what we recommend. Uh, if the patient has a contraindication of using systemic steroids, we will use in, uh, periocular or intravitreal steroids. And you need to know if your patient is a steroid responder or not, and be prepared to. Uh, fix that problem if it happens. Now, this is an old paper, but it's still a very valid uh, manuscript uh, that show that there are some specific pathologies that uh, you know that steroids are not going to be enough um, to um, quiet the inflammation. And specifically, I highlight here two that we see as ocular surface specialist, which is necrotizing scleritis and mucous membrane pemphigus. So we know right from the start, that topical anti-inflammatory therapy with steroids and systemic anti-inflammatory th therapy with steroids is not going to be enough. And we need to be prepared either by referring the patient to an internal medicine specialist or a rheumatologist or to one of our uveitis uh, colleagues because it's very important. So this should be done responsible with a good collaboration and ordering the, the, the correct laboratories in order to monitor this patient. Uh, this, this, these medications that we're going to review uh, very briefly, um, our medications are very safe when they use responsible. There are manuscripts published on this. For example, there's a very good manuscript that that shows that with the use of this, with the responsible use of these medications, the risk of um, developing cancer is the same as the as the same as the risk of developing cancer in the in the general population. So this is a very common question I get from my adult patients. Uh, we do. Uh, we do the oncological screenings that are pro uh, appropriate for the age of the patient, and then we feel comfortable starting these medications. Most of the medications that we're going to use as ocular surgery specialists, I would say, are the anti-metabolites. There, I would say, in my practice, control about 80% of, of the inflammatory conditions. Um, you can play with either one of them, but these medications uh, are, work quite well and can be well tolerated. T-cell inhibitors is something that we don't use much uh, to control the inflammation, but we use them to um, improve the prognosis of our transplant patients with. And there are some other medications uh, more uh, uh, with more uh, side effects that uh, you need to use them uh, very responsibly, like cy cytoxin, uh, cyclophosphamide, that are specifically helpful in the management of uh, difficult cases of pemphigoid or necrotizing scleritis. 
So we want to take this patient to the operating room. We want to make sure that the inflammation is controlled and that we want to prevent inflammation. So we start this patient on steroids uh, before, and uh, we do give a pulse of steroids in the operating room. And depending on the case, uh, decide uh, if we need to do post-op oral steroids. Or Every time we're going to encounter a patient with uveitis uh, or a history of inflammation, either ocular surface inflammation, with that uh, also affected the, the inside of the eye. I think just one of the principles of surgery in general, not just an ophthalmic surgery, in general surgery is exposure, exposure, exposure. So we're uh, going to have to deal with iris uh, issues in, in most of these patients. In fact, Patients with ocular cicatricial pemphigo uh, um, um, have this very characteristic way of that the iris and, this, and the tissues behave. Those of you who do surgery in this type of patients, I know what, what I'm talking about. It's almost like doing a, a cataract surgery in a coronal patient with floppy iris syndrome. So you need to be prepared. So I'm going to be walking you through different surgeries, um, and starting for simple uh, things that we can do, for example, a lot of my cataract surgeries, and most vast majority, are done with um, sedation through the vein and uh, a topical anesthesia. And we can supplement with what we call here uh, sugarcane, which is preservative-free epinephrine and lidocaine. And this is very helpful in cases that you have a small pupil. Uh, you don't, and you want to avoid the use of, uh, um, you want to avoid the use of any tools like uh, rings or hooks and things like that. This is, of course, not a patient with uh, uveitis. Uh, this is just a, an average uh, cataract, uh, just to show how effective, even though this patient had a, enough dilating drops uh, and, and were not effective, then using this, plus the use of viscoelastic uh, can help you get a proper uh, dilation and complete your case uh, uh, routinely with, without any, any complications. We have many tools um, uh, to uh, expand pupils. I'm still, I'm still very, uh, very fan. I, I really like the iris hooks because you can uh, customize the amount of dilation that you want. If you need to do an IOL exchange, you may need a larger dilation compared to a, just a, a cataract surgery. Uh, and this is something that the rings won't do it. So I like iris hooks, um, especially because, you know, there's cases like this, for example, this is not a patient with ocular surface disease, but it's a patient with significant corneal disease. It's a, a patient with monocular patient with congenital glaucoma uh, that uh, through his lifetime, this patient is 20 years old, now has two glaucoma tubes, one right here and one uh, supratemporal. I'm operating temporal. This tube is uh, from the infranasal. Uh, and this patient, I did a DSEC some years before that lasted about three three to four year and now they're having edema and now the cataract got worse. And so we have to do this cataract surgery and the visibility is hard because the DSEC is failed. Now we remove the DSEC and it improves the visibility. With, with the use of iris hooks, I can control how much dilation, where do I need the dilation and um, uh, be able to plan my cataract surgery uh, better. So uh, in this, in this patients, the, the good thing about this patients is once you, have a um, capsular rexus like we did right here with the assistance of my fellow with an endoscope. Um, you have a capsular rexus, you can prolapse the lens into the anterior chamber because this patient has no endothelial or very unhealthy endothelial. I already removed a, a failed dissect and do your case uh, higher up. That way you don't um, uh, mess with the, ca with the capsule and um, safely implant an intraocular lens and uh, um, once you have that, we can uh, go ahead and do a DSEC and, and finish, uh, finish the case. But I think iris hooks are specifically helpful in cases like, cases like this. Uh, I am also a big fan of the Malugan ring. I have no financial interest. In fact, I always, um, I always joke with uh, Dr. Malugan that I use it so much because I, I did a uveitis fellowship and I do a lot of this uveitis cataract. So that, um, uh, I probably pay for his new car. So there's also the eye ring. Uh, it's another technology that's been available for, for the past two, three years here in the United States. It's very similar to the Malugan ring. They're both effective. I have no, no preference. So I think this is the poster child of UBD cataracts. Um, and perils that I, I can give you uh, is if you if you have the synechia, which are very common, uh, I like to lice, I always like to have two paracentesis already because I know we're going to be needing them uh, as the case move, uh, moves forward. 
But most important is to get that pupil to the right size. So I like to use a cohesive viscoelastic uh, because when you open the pupil, if you need to stay in that capsule, if the cataract is, is dense enough, it's easier to remove than a dispersed viscoelastic, as you know. So um, I like to do that and be prepared. Uh, and most of the time, uh, you are able to get away with uh, without staining the capsule, but sometimes you have to to stain, and it's better to be able to remove that. And, and once you once you have that pupil, um, once you have that pupil enlarged, then the case goes routinely. Uh, you have a good visibility. The synechias are already released. And I like to use uh, 6.25 uh, um, in a uh, mulligan ring because I don't, that way I don't expand the pupil too much and create all these um, changes to the pupil. But um, other peril is uh, when in doubt, uh, uh, put a suture. Uh, this, these patients are immunosuppressed and sometimes the tissues are damaged and they don't seal as well. So uh, I always try to uh, place a suture. What do we know about intraocular lens? I think that uh, we all uh, feel comfortable using an acrylic uh, uh, foldable lens uh, in these patients. Uh, the goal should be to place it in the back. These patients with uveitis or ocular surface and tear segment inflammation have a poor tolerance to lenses in the sulcus. If you have to put it in the sulcus, my recommendation is try to capture uh, the haptic with the capsule. That way the lens stays stable and it's not moving. Uh, if you are in a, in a complicated situation, there's nothing wrong uh, to leave this eye aphakic. I mean, uh, you're going to have to have a discussion with the patient, but you can have that discussion before, which is very recommended, um, that if um, case don't go as planned, it's better to leave him aphakic than having a lens there that's causing problems. So I was, I was saying that we need to control the, we need to control the inflammation as well in the post-op period as in the pre-op uh, period. Uh, and when you have patients that have inflammation post-op that does not making sense, like the, you should be, you know, it was a straightforward case and the inflammation is not getting better. You should also think that you may not be dealing with other pathologies. For example, this is a patient that had no uveitis or no disease, had a straightforward cataract surgery and on the post-op uh, week two, developed this granulomatous uveitis and ended up, after a proper systemic workup, being a syphilitic uveitis that responded with penicillin uh, treatment. So always be vigilant. And if things are not making sense, um, think that you may be dealing with other pathologies. We're talking about cataract surgery. I always get asked if I use the femtosecond laser. I normally don't uh, for my routine cataracts. There are some specific situations that I may use a femtosecond laser. For example, in uh, patients uh, that come from the uveitis service that had a retinitis, for example, and they require silicon oil, and then the patient has a white cataract or an intumescent cataract, for example, um, a patient that, like this one, that the cataract is so uh, hypermature that it's causing a narrow of the anterior chamber, and I don't want to have that silicone oil coming forward, uh, then, you know, doing a capsulorexis in a more controlled environment may be beneficial. There's not, there's not a good data uh, published on the use of femtosecond laser and uv cataracts, but these are some situations that I've used. Uh, um, there are other situations with uh, uv cataracts, such as this one. This was, uh, this is a patient that had a um, syphilitic uveitis uh, and not a very responsible patient uh, and uh, not coming to many of the appointments, but eventually got the inflammation under control. And uh, it was an interesting cataract. I call it the, the let it snow cataract. It was, we did it in, we did it uh, in uh, Christmas. Yeah, yeah, video. Okay. You, can, you can see the video? Yes? Okay. So this is the only cataract that I've done in my life that I actually had to to insert viscoelastic into the capsule so I could finish the rexus because when I open the rexus, you can see all this liquefied refractive particles coming out. The whole cataract came out um, through, the, through the main incision and I ended up with an empty capsule, uh, capsular bag. So I had to use a heavy viscoelastic to fill out the capsule, complete my uh, capsular rexus, and then um, 
Uh, also interesting, this patient had adhesions inside the capsule, uh, a band of fibrotic tissue. I, I eventually cut it with intraocular scissors uh, so I could have a intact posterior capsule and a capsular bag and eventually implanted a uh, lens. I do recommend uh, this patient, I didn't do it, but uh, um, I didn't do a surgical iridectomy, but in patients that uh, you have any doubt uh, that the inflammation can be very severe in the post-op period, um, a, a decent sized surgical iridectomy, this patient developed uh, because he was not following uh, the, the treatment plan, uh, he developed a iris bone bay. One thing that we've been seeing, and I've already done three cases like this, is what I call the really corticosteroid induced cataract because this patient had macular edema for some other issue. They injected a, um, a uh, steroid uh, depot, uh, Osrdex, and, and the patient moved while they were doing the injection. So they, the, the implant ended up in the, inside the crystalline lens. Now, I, I approached this case as a posterior polar cataract uh, because there, were, there had to be some rupture of the capsule. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the case actually went... Uh, well, I, it is not very difficult. I, I, this, this material, you, you can see, is like a powder. It's very easy to fake with, so there's no major problems with this. I did um, uh, try to remove the nucleus first and uh, uh, leaving the shelf to make sure there was no, no holes with uh, you know, conservative settings. And I tried to look for a, with a gonio lens for, for a, um, a hole in the capsule, but there was none, and I ended up putting a lens inside it inside the capsule. So another condition that I encounter a lot as an ocular surface uveitis specialist is that the, the oncology service sends me a lot of the radiation cataracts. So I'll show you two classic cataracts uh, from uh, radiation. Um, and this was a, a melanoma of the ciliary body and it was a large melanoma of the ciliary body. And when you have melanomas of the ciliary body, the radiation of course is gonna be very close to the lens. So there's most of the patients develop white um, hypermature cataracts and uh, these patients can have a little more corneal edema in the post-op period uh, than the average. Uh, and some of these patients uh, will uh, develop uh, some mild or partial limbal stem cell deficiency. So you have to be aware and protect the, the endothelium. But the interesting case of this case is when I was uh, uh, doing the, the case, it was a white cataract. And once I had the, uh, the pupil and the case, you know, with this type of cataracts can be chopping really really easy, it was not very dense. And once I removed the, the cataract, the, the tumor was the same color as the cataract. So I, I accidentally feel, felt that I, I faco what, was, what I was thinking it was cataract, but it was actually the necrotic tumor that was right against the lens. So um, uh, in this patient, I decided to, now the vitreous was not coming forward because it was all fibrotic and we ended up putting a lens in the sulcus with capturing with the anterior segment and the lens was um, stable. Um, this is, you know, uh, the, uh, a problem that we, we see in patients that have multiple episodes of radiation. This patient had a metastatic leiomyosarcoma to the, um, to the posterior segment. So she had tumor in the retina and had uh, seven episodes of uh, radiation. And uh, the, actually, uh, this is a surgery that I learned in India. I learned, uh, and I see Vikash already joined, and I learned uh, at LV Prasad uh, uh, with Dr. San Juan and Sayan Basu. And I actually taught this surgery to an, uh, the surgeon who did it. Uh, and you see that they, they referred it back to me for possible corneal transplantation. But the problem that was that the patient had retained amniotic membrane. And the, the surgeons, the retina surgeons really needed the view of the back. There was the cataract got really dense. So this, this type of patient, you, you don't have to do any keratoplasty, just sit and wait and the membrane will, uh, uh, will slowly dissolve. And, uh, uh, and if not, you can accomplish cataract surgery. See, these patients that had radiation behave like the pemphigoid patients, the tissue don't uh, heal very well and you, you require uh, sutures to close the wounds. Uh, it's very important that you obtain that seal. Um, I, I tell my fellows that, you know, when we do cataract surgery and I'm gonna start approaching to now more ocular surface conditions when the visibility is hard. So just like a pilot, uh, when you can fly with, and it's very nice and you can see everything is very easy, but sometimes things start to get really, really hazy and you have to be prepared and trust your instruments, trust your machine, trust your nurses and have everything ready in the operating room so you can do a, a safe, um, safe landing and, and deliver that lens where it's supposed to be.
when you're gonna do surgery in ocular surface patients, you have to prepare that ocular surface. So if there's eyelid pathology, if there's lid margin disease, you have to fix all that before jumping into cataract surgery. We know that this is possible with the correct management of the inflammation. So this is one of our manuscripts that show that when you uh, correctly um, uh, treat the inflammation, these patients can have entropion repair, fornix reconstruction, mucous membrane grafts, et cetera. And usually it will take, with the use of an anti-metabolite, for example, it, can, it will take you about three to four months to get this eyes into quiescent in order that you can safely, um, you can safely do the cataract surgery. I'm almost done with the videos. This is a patient that uh, had a neurotrophic cornea from a severe uh, herpetic disease that got uh, complicated by a fungal keratitis and required a therapeutic graft. And then the patient came to me, he wanted to have another graft. And I said, sir, this is still not uh, ready for a graft. And uh, uh, the eye was still very, very um, inflamed. And it was a recent patch graft and uh, there was heavy neovascularization. So um, the reason we did cataract surgery is because he had all this angle closed and the, the cataract was getting um, um, into mesen and it was uh, occluding the angle. So we decided that we will take the cataract out, have a window of opportunity that still the graph was clear in this side and uh, leave the patient uh, with, uh, with this graph, let it quiet. In fact, this patient is coming back in October um, to, for the possibility of regrafting if, if we feel it would help. But um, his pressures have been well controlled now. And um, here, you know, I didn't feel comfortable putting any rings inside. The visibility was hard. I could have used an iris hook but I got the pupil large enough just uh, uh, with uh, manual dilation of the pupil. And my advice here is that you do a large rexis. So here I did a small rexis and I had to supplement, I had to cut a little bit more in order to have a, a rexis and you have more, more room to, to maneuver and try to keep yourself in the center. I uh, use um, um, conservative settings in your machine and eventually you can, and if you're not in doubt that your capsule is not okay, you can always use an endo illuminator and always close your wound and, and be done. Um, in patients with cicatricial disease, we have, you know, again, need to control the inflammation. This patient, we first send them to fix the, had an entropion. Uh, you can see the lashes over here, superior entropion, and that was repaired. The patient had significant uh, limbal stem cell deficiency. I mean, maybe mild to moderate, uh, and uh, we eventually uh, take him to surgery. Now, th the problem with these patients here is that when you want to put a, a, a speculum, uh, it is impossible because of the symblepharon. So uh, I recommend doing a good retrovolvar anesthesia, blocking these lids, and you can pass a suture, and that way have good um, good exposure. Um, this case went routinely after after doing that. And the second eye, the problem that I want to share with you is, and my mistake in this surgery was that I did it in a different center that we have. In our main center, anesthesia blocks the patient. So I was assuming this patient was already blocked, and but he was not, and the patient was not complaining. And uh, as the case went by, um, I felt it was going to be much easier because the symblepharons were not there. I didn't have to put traction sutures. Uh, but then the patient started having a lot of positive pressure to the point that I felt that there might be something in the posterior segment. You see the iris wants to come out uh, and I started to get worried. And the problem was that the patient, you know, these patients are very photophobic and uh, uh, he was uh, not a patient that complains. He was not saying anything, but when I asked him, he was uncomfortable. He was very uncomfortable. As soon as I supplemented peribulbar anesthesia, the patient uh, positive pressure went away and we were able to finish the case with, uh, without any problem. So um, in ocular surface patients, topical anesthesia is not something that you should do. You should, um, you should uh, block this patient's give enough anesthesia so you can do a comfortable surgery. This is a patient with um, chronic atopic conjunctivitis with a pseudoterygium. Um, and the problem here is it was a very mature uh, cataract uh, with a um, very hazy cornea from all those years of inflammation. And then the uh, the lens um, got very mature, so you want to use your uh, best technique that you feel more comfortable. In my case, it's horizontal chopping. But here, when I was doing the irrigation aspiration, I felt that something was wrong, and I checked, and it was okay. But when I checked again, uh, I know I noticed there was a hole in the capsule, and uh, uh, well, you need to enlarge your wound, uh, um, inject this scholastic, and and we. With the assistance of the endoscope, we put a three-piece lens and did a 
and a vitrectomy. I like to do my vitrectomies uh, uh, with an anterior infusion through the pars plana uh, in order to manage the vitreous better. Um, there are not many articles on the use of uh, cataract surgery in pemphigoid patients. One of them is uh, from uh, my call, I call him my Indian mentor, Dr. San Juan, which I learned a lot from him. Um, and he showed that it, with the proper steps, is uh, safe and effective. Uh, so again, uh, you, the same steps, you have to control inflammation, you have to repair the lids uh, first. Uh, you have to have a, as healthy as possible ocular surface in order to uh, approach to this case. This is a recent case that I did on a pemphigoid patient, monocular patient um, that had hand motion visions from this cataract. Now the eye is very red because of the betadine. Uh, this patient had full control of the inflammation with mycophenolate, and she had this small area of, of uh, cornea with no limbal stem cell, oh, with partial limbal stem cell deficiency, in the, but you could, we could still see through. Uh, again, endoscope, capsular rexis. And the problem with this surgery is that you can prolapse the lens into the anterior chamber because you want to preserve as much as the endothelium because you don't want to do a transplant in a pemphigoid patient. Uh, so um, this is a patient that we operated early in March. Then we were sent home for, because of the pandemic and the current times that we're living. And the use of telemedicine was excellent in this patient because we were able to monitor her ocular surface inflammation through a Zoom camera. Our EMR system is hooked with Zoom and we can see the patients. And we, she actually, uh, we, we are not allowing patients to come into the building uh, with family. So she was able to walk on her own to her appointment in June. Uh, and we were all very happy to see, and she was very happy uh, with that. So um, uh, the next case is a Stephen Johnson patient, and this is a case that maybe I let Dr. Namrata Sharma comment because she published this paper, and the case is from her. She shared with me this nice video. And uh, the perils here is that you want to do a small incision, a clear corneal incision, try to avoid a scleral incision or extracapsular incision, um, you want uh, to use the endoscope. You want to avoid epithelial defects on while you're doing the surgery. Uh, and uh, you want to have very good anesthesia. So these are the perils that she described in this series of patients where the results uh, were, uh, were very good. Um, and to finish, you know, I think it's important that you talk to your patients. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this, but um, this is, this is, uh, the doctor's uh, explaining how to use the medications and she's not using the medication correctly. And she says she's using it correctly, but uh, she's gonna show how to use the inhaler for asthma. So we have to teach our patients how to use the medications and really spend the time because we can avoid a lot of problems. It's you know really great to be with you guys here. I have so many good friends and uh, mentors uh, that I really admire um, from India. I learn a lot every time I go there and I hope to continue to do that. I hope with this pandemic gets better and I can continue to see uh, my friends. And here we have our main organizer who spent some time with us and he's always welcome to, to come back. Uh, thank you very much.